Today we are going to talk about pericardial diseases. So about pericardium. Pericardium is the membranous sac surrounding the heart. It consists of two layers, the visceral layer and the parietal layer. And normally there is about 25 to 50 milliliters of pericardial fluid in the pericardial cavity. And about the functions of the pericardium. So the function of the pericardium includes maintaining an optimal cardiac shape, reducing friction between the beating heart and adjacent structures, protecting the heart from other diseases which are caused by the neighboring organs such as TB in the lungs, then inflammation of the lungs that is pneumonia, cancer, etc. Then it also prevents the overfilling of the heart. Now we are going to classify pericardial diseases. Pericardial diseases can be broadly classified into congenital defects, then about pericarditis, then pericardial neoplasms and pericardial cysts. So congenitally there may be absence of the pericardial sac as such or may be regional defects in the pericardium. Next we are going to talk about pericarditis. First acute pericarditis. Acute pericarditis is an inflammation of the pericardium as the name suggests and about the etiology the disease may be idiopathic or secondary to other diseases for example viral infections such as Coxsackie B virus, cytomegalovirus etc and then bacterial infections such as staphylococcus species, streptococcus species and tuberculosis. Then post my, uh, myocardial infarction complications then certain drugs then malignancies, collagen vascular disease then uh, then uremia etc. Next about the pathophysiology. So uh, pericarditis has a has a progression in three stages which includes the early stage in which there is fibrous protein pericarditis. There is a accumulation of fibrous protein in the pericardial sac and next in the progressive stage there is a rapid effusive pericarditis and which may progress even to acute cardiac tamponade and which can lead to chronic accumulation and expanding of the pericardium and progress to myopericarditis. Then the final stage is the exudate will become completely dissolved and absorbed and this may organize and form a calcified pericardium and, and cause a secondary constrictive pericarditis. And what happens in the cardiac physiology is when there is acute pericardial effusion the pressure of the pericardial cavity increases and this in, in, in turn increases the filling pressure of the ventricle during diastole and hair thereby decreases the stroke volume and hence decreases the blood pressure. About the clinical manifestations of pericarditis in the uh, in the first stage that is a fibro fibrous protein pericarditis the symptoms include uh, chest pain which is classically retrosternal or precordial in uh, described classically in the midsection area then the character is classically described as sharp shooting dull and sharp shooting or compressive type of pain and rarely it may be dull also then when it worsens patients have breathing difficulty and coughing and especially during lying down and the pain, the chest pain may be relieved during sitting and leaning forward. And on examination, the clinical findings you will uh, find is a classically a pericardial friction rub both during the systole and diastole. And this finding is generally diagnostic. And in the second stage, that is the pericardial effusion stage, uh, in, in which there are the symptoms include dyspnea, classically the dyspnea. And uh, symptoms due to pressure include dry cough. What happens is, is this pericardial uh, effusion will, will compress over the bronchus and cause dry cough and hoarseness rarely when it involves the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Then dysphagia when it compresses the esophagus. Then uh, when you elicit the signs you will see uh, there may there will be tachycardia, there will be indistinct hard sounds and something classically known as EWART sign which is consolidation of the lower lobe of lung, left lung. And uh, vital uh, examination you will see there will be a hypotension, there may be a reduced pulp, pulse pressure and even pa paradoxical pulse, pulses paradoxes uh, which is 
defined as an exaggerated reduction in the uh, pulse of, of more than in the uh, uh, blood pressure more than 10 millimeters of mercury during inspiration. Then there may be uh, signs of systemic uh, circulation congestion which include uh, distended jugular veins and peripheral edema. Then the next clinical manifestations when it progresses to cardiac tamponade means uh, there will be uh, there will be a classically a triad known as Beck's triad which include hypotension, uh, di distended jugular veins and uh, muffled heart sounds. Then in the chronic or subacute stage there will be increased venous pressure, congestion of the systemic circulation, then um, Kusmal sign which is dilatation of jugular vein during inspiration. Then laboratory investigations, classically we take an ECG to look for changes. In the stage 1 that is the uh, fibrous proteinous change that time there will be ST segment elevation which is universal and concave upwards and classically it is described as concave upwards okay and in all leads except AVR and V1 without reciprocal ST segment depression. So that is a classical uh, description of ST uh, changes in acute pericarditis there is concave upward ST elevation in all leads except AVR and V1 and there will be no reciprocal ST depression. So reciprocal ST depression if it is present you should think in terms of MI, acute MI. Then stage 2 there is ST segment, uh, uh, ST segment will return to the baseline and the initial upright T wave will become flattened with, which may take a uh, few days. Then the next is stage 3 in which there is T wave inversions. And stage 4 there will be T wave will become, uh, will become normal or, uh, or stay as inverted. Other changes which include uh, uh, electrical alternance when there is uh, large effusion causing cardiac tamponade and reduced uh, voltage complexes. So in this ECG you can see there is concave upwards ST elevation in all leads except AVR and V1. So this is classical of acute pericarditis in stage 1 that is the fibrous proteinaceous pericarditis. Then the next is uh, there is uh, this is to differentiate between MI and, uh, uh, and pericarditis. In MI there is uh, ST elevation in contiguous leads. In this you can see 2-3 AVF there is ST elevation and reciprocal ST depression in the opposite leads and that is 1 AVL V5 to V6 and V1 to V4. Next, next the ECG uh, changes are uh, hence described. Next is chest X-ray. Chest X-ray, the uh, there will be a the cardiac shadow will be uh, enlarged and classically described as water bottle appearance, and the lungs will show a clear lung field. And uh, as the posture changes, cardiac silhouette also changes apparently in the chest X-ray. And echocardiograph is the best non-invasive investigation for confirming a diagnosis of pericardial effusion. When you keep the echo probe classically in the uh, subcostal view, subcostal view uh, is the best view to see a pericardial effusion. You can see the uh, rim of pericardium, uh, pericardial fluid. It, if it is tamponade, it will be a very large pericardial fluid with very minimal contraction of the heart. So lab laboratory investigations when we uh, ask for classically we get help to do pericardiosynthesis and it helps to dif uh, differentiate whether the uh, fluid is exudative or transudative and the fluid uh, taken from the pericardiosynthesis done under ultrasound guidance should be sent for protein glucose and LDH assays L uh, and LDH Glucose and proteins helps to determine if the fluid is transudate or exudate. Then cytology and tumor markers especially CEA, AFP, CA125 and so on to look for malignancy. Then ANA assay if collagen vascular diseases suspected such as SLE. Then next pericardiosynthesis can also be therapeutic. It can relieve the pressure of the pericardial ca cavity and it also increases the stroke volume and hence the cardiac output. Next, how do you di diagnose a pericarditis? Uh, it's classically through the history, 
there will be chest pain which is aggravated by coughing inspiration or recumbency that is when patient lies down then pericardial friction rub on auscultation then classic ecg changes then chest x-ray and uh, pericardial fluid analysis can uh, can re uh, relieve uh, reveal the diagnosis of acute pericarditis so how to differentiate between the causes of acute pericarditis when you uh, when you see there are several causes of peric acute pericarditis which include idiopathic which has no uh, no uh, cause per se then next is tuberculous pericarditis secondary to tb then purulent pericarditis that is that's bacterial pericard pericarditis then malignancy then posterior uh, post pericardial stemi syndrome in which a history uh, will classically reveal a uh, history of upper respiratory tract infection and acute onset often recurrent in an acute idiopathic pericarditis and uh, uh, whereas in TB there will be an accompanied primary uh, lung, lung TB will also be present then uh, in purulent pericarditis there will be accompanied uh, um, with in, uh, septicemia will be present then malignancy caused by metastatic tumor uh, commonly uh, the primary malignancy of the pericardium is very rare metastasis of the pericardium is common then uh, then a history of cardiac injury such as uh, operation uh, such as pericardiostomy and uh, uh, then history of myocardial infarction etc can be seen in post pericardio uh, pericardiostomy syndrome then history of fever is um, uh, present in acute pericard idiopathic pericarditis and purulent pericarditis and uh, or post pericardiostomy syndrome but it is never present in tuberculous pericarditis and malignancy then uh, pericardial friction rub will be uh, present in the acute idiopathic pericarditis and it is never seen in the malignancy and post pericardiostomy pa syndrome patients then chest pain is uh, uh, severely present in the acute idiopathic pericarditis and it is uh, never seen in the tuberculous pericarditis and malignancy then about leukocyte count leukocyte count may be normal or uh, elevated in the acute idiopathic pericarditis whereas in in uh, uh, in purulent pericarditis will be significantly increased and in uh, tuberculosis and malignancy it may be may or may not be increased then blood culture will be significantly positive in the purulent pericarditis and a volume of pericardial fluid will be massive in purulent pericarditis and malignancy uh, and the characteristics of the uh, fluid will be in in purulent pericarditis it will look pu purulent and cloudy whereas in um, idiopathic pericarditis it may look uh, yellow or hematic uh, and in tuberculous pericarditis it might, might be blood tinged and uh, whereas in post pericardiostomy syndrome it may be serous next we're going to talk about treatment of acute pericarditis uh, the first and foremost you have to treat the etiology which includes uh, treating the infection if it is present next uh, first identifying the infection what sort of infection it is bacterial viral or tb or malignancy or collagen vascular disease then relieve the pain with nsaid colchicin steroids etc then if pain is if the symptoms are severe and causing uh, hypotension or cardiac failure you should go ahead with the pericardiosynthesis it it is both diagnostic and therapeutic next about constrictive pericarditis Constrictive pericarditis is a thickening and fibrosis of the pericardium that occurs long after an acute episode of pericarditis. It produces decreased diastolic filling. Hence, it is called constrictive pericarditis. It is a form of obstructive shock. And, the, and tuberculosis is the leading cause of uh, uh, constrictive pericarditis in underdeveloped countries. Uh, it may be attributable to about 40 percent other causes include purulent inflammation pericardial injury radiation therapy etc next about clinical manifestations clinical manifestations you have to look for uh, symptoms which include uh, dyspnea on exertion and orthopnea other symptoms may be uh, hypodynamia and big and obesity may be present then next 
physical uh, signs on elicitation will reveal uh, distended jugular veins, Kussmaul sign, edema, ascites, etc. Heart sounds are distant and a pericardial knock is seen after S2. Then there will be reduction in the, in the systolic BP and increase in the diastolic BP and decrease in the pulse pressure. This is a classical finding of constructive pericarditis. And on uh, laboratory investigations, uh, you can go ahead with a, a chest X-ray, CT or a cardiac MRI which may reveal pericardial calcification. ECG classically re uh, reveals a low voltage complex in limb leads and T wave is low or upside down and there may be atrial arrhythmias. Then echo is the most important and uh, most uh, significant uh, non-invasive te uh, technique to diagnose uh, peri uh, constructive pericarditis. It will show pericardial thickening and calcification can also be seen. Then the, uh, these are few images. This is a chest x-ray showing uh, enlarged bottle shaped heart, uh, bottle shaped heart and there is calcification in the CT present. Here you can see the thin rim of fluid associated with calcification. Next diagnosis of constructive pericarditis. Uh, uh, the, on uh, clinical examination you will see uh, signs of congestion of systemic circulation including uh, distended jugular veins, edema, then pericardial knock on uh, auscultation, then uh, investigation such as chest x-ray, cardiac MRI, CT or echocardiographic imaging showing a thickened or calcified pericardium. Next treatment, pericardiectomy is the treatment of choice and it should be done as early as po possible. Anti-TB therapy may be required if the underlying cause is tuberculosis and should be continued for a period of one year. Thank you. So I hope you like the video. If you like the video, kindly share and subscribe to our channel. If you want us to up upload any particular video that uh, video on a topic that you want, kindly uh, drop a comment. Thank you. Jai Hind.